Hi everyone, Chica here with NART Dojo where we discuss pathological narcissism, spirituality, and raising your awareness. If you are new to the channel, welcome, and if you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. Today, we are diving into a topic that affects countless individuals but is often misunderstood and overlooked. So today, we will be discussing who is a pathological narcissist and what exactly is narcissistic abuse. We invite you to join us in this important conversation whether you've experienced narcissistic abuse directly or you want to learn how to support someone else who has. Together, we can shed light on this issue and help individuals on their journey towards healing and empowerment. So, what is narcissistic abuse? At its core, narcissistic abuse is a pattern of harmful behavior exhibited by individuals who rank high on narcissistic traits. So, there are three main features of pathological narcissists. So, you're dealing with people that are extremely grandiose. So, they believe that they are superior to others without merit. They also require excessive amounts of attention, admiration, and validation. And finally, they are empathy impaired. So you're dealing with someone that will harm you and they will not feel bad about doing it because they are unable to put themselves in other people's shoes. Before we jump into some of the signs and red flags to look out for, it is important to understand that you are dealing with individuals who manipulate exploit and emotionally harm others for their gain and self-esteem. Now, if you believe that you are dealing with a pathological narcissist, you will need to safely make an exit. You're dealing with people that are highly manipulative and highly self-involved and they really do not care about anybody else but themselves. Let's go ahead and discuss how to spot a pathological narcissist. Spotting a pathological narcissist can be challenging because they often excel at concealing their true nature, especially in the early stages of a relationship. It is important to understand that narcissism, pathological narcissism, at its core operates very covertly. However, understand that there are some signs that you can watch out for. So here are 10 signs that you can use to spot a pathological narcissist. Number one is an exaggerated sense of self-importance. So narcissists have an inflated sense of self. This is their ego. So they may constantly talk about their achievements, talents, or importance in a way that feels excessive. This is going to rub you the wrong way. Number two is a lack of empathy. Anybody that is lacking empathy should be a walking red flag. And narcissists struggle to empathize with others. They may appear indifferent to the feelings and needs of those around them. For example, look out for strange behaviors such as people that are rude to staff in restaurants for no reason, or even let's say you're going through a very difficult time in your life and you're communicating with them, but it really feels like they are not listening. And this is really because they do not care. I oftentimes see comments on this channel and other narcissistic abuse recovery channels where you could be crying your eyes out and the narcissist is going to look at you with a blank stare or they may even get upset. And this again is because they are empathy impaired. They really do not care. Number three, manipulation. Pathological narcissists are skilled manipulators because this is behavior that they have practiced. So they use tactics such as gaslighting, guilt tripping, emotional blackmail, playing the victim, etc. And this is so that they can control others. Number four, look out for a high sense of entitlement. Narcissists believe that they are entitled to special treatment and often expect others to cater to their needs and desires. For example, you could be dealing with a narcissist that was a golden child in their dysfunctional family system and this means then that they were coddled. 
Children that are spoiled normally grow up to be egomaniacs. They end up narcissistic. They are highly entitled, so they believe that they should get anything that they want. Number five is a fragile self-esteem. You're dealing with people with pathologically low self-esteem. This means then that you will have to prop up their ego because you're not really dealing with people that are self-reflecting. They're really just projecting their deep inner shame onto others. So despite their grandiosity, narcissists actually have fragile self-esteem. They are easily wounded by criticism or perceived slights. This drives their constant need for validation and they may seek it through social media, compliments, admiration, etc. Number six, difficulty in maintaining relationships. Narcissists oftentimes can get their way into relationships, but they do have problems maintaining healthy relationships. This is the result of lying and conniving your way through life. If you really take a look, you'll see where narcissists oftentimes have troubled relationships. And this includes a history of broken friendships, intimate relationships, and marriages. Number seven, look out for attention-seeking behavior. Narcissists crave attention and validation, and they may go to great lengths to be the center of attention in social settings or even on social media. I mentioned before that narcissists have pathologically low self-esteem. So understand when somebody is unable to esteem themselves, they have to get this esteem from others. And we call this other esteem. Number eight, and this is a very big one. Look out for boundary violations. Narcissists have very poor respect for other people's boundaries and they may invade your personal space and privacy. At a parental level, think of the parents that will read through a child's personal diary. And at a relationship level, at an intimate relationship level, think of the narcissist that will want to follow you into the bathroom. They really are not giving you any personal space because they do not understand proper boundaries. Number nine is idealization and devaluation. So in relationships, narcissists tend to idealize their partners initially only to devalue and discard them later when they no longer serve their needs. This is because narcissists are always looking for a new source of supply, someone that they can attach to that they can drain the energy from. You're dealing with a type of energy vampirism. Again, they're not able to generate this energy on their own, so they must get to other people and siphon that energy. Next up, number 10 is projection. And narcissists often project their own negative traits onto others, so they may accuse you of the very behaviors that they are engaged in. For example, in an intimate relationship setting, pathological narcissists may accuse you of cheating when they were the ones that were cheating all the time. You are witnessing this severe degree of projection because you're dealing with someone that is based in their ego and egos do not self-reflect, egos project. I'll actually give you a bonus one. So let's make this 11 ways to spot a pathological narcissist. And number 11 is a lack of accountability. So pathological narcissists rarely take accountability for their mistakes or shortcomings. Instead, they would be blaming this off onto other people or external circumstances. This is because pathological narcissists have what we call an external locus of control. People that have an external locus of control believe that things that are happening in their life are the responsibility of external factors, so people, places, and things, and they really won't take responsibility for their behavior. Additionally, pathological narcissists are unable to take accountability for their behavior because they are stuck in the third dimension. Pathological narcissist is a type of severe psycho spiritual arrested development where at an emotional level, they are based in shame and they are unable to move past their pride 
and in order to be accountable, then one must have courage. Courage, however, is a part of higher awareness that is available in the fourth dimension, that which we call rational or linear thinking, if we're looking at this on the Hawking scale or the map of consciousness. So at the low level awareness that pathological narcissists are at, they are unable to give you accountability. It is important to remember that not everybody that exhibits one or two of these behaviors is necessarily a pathological narcissist because narcissism itself exists on a spectrum and people can display narcissistic traits without having a full-blown personality disorder. However, if you notice a consistent pattern of these behaviors in someone who is causing harm or distress to you, it is wise to seek professional guidance or consider distancing yourself from the individual to protect your well-being. Pathological narcissists are abusers. They exist in victim-abuser consciousness. The only relationship they will have with one of these personality types is a victim-abuser type relationship. If they're going to be the abuser, then you're going to be the victim. And if they're master, then you're going to be the slave. There is no equality in victim-abuser consciousness. Spotting a pathological narcissist gets easier when you understand that they have a pattern. The narcissistic abuse cycle is a pattern of behavior that narcissists often employ to control and manipulate their victims. This cycle typically consists of four main stages. So that's going to be idealization, devaluation, discard or rejection, and hoovering. Here is an overview of each stage. 1. Idealization The narcissist starts the relationship with intense love bombing and attention. They may shower the victim with compliments, gifts, trips, and attention. And when this is done, then the victim feels adored and cherished, believing that they have found their true match. They may overlook red flags due to the overwhelming positive attention, or they may be unaware of the red flags, meaning that they don't understand what that means. 2. Devaluation In the devaluation stage, here is going to come the switch in the narcissist behavior. So narcissistic abusers employ a range of tactics such as gaslighting, manipulation, and emotional blackmail to control and dominate their victims. These tactics can be subtle and insidious, making it challenging for the victims to recognize the abuse. Gradually, the narcissist's behavior shifts. They become critical, emotionally distant, or even verbally abusive. The victim is normally left confused and hurt by the sudden change in the narcissist's behavior. They may question what they did wrong and try harder to regain the initial love and approval. It is important that you understand that pathological narcissists are incapable of love. This is why they love bomb. And love bombing is one of the many manipulation tactics that pathological narcissists use to overwhelm and manipulate their victims. 3. Discard The narcissist decides to discard the victim emotionally and or physically. They may abruptly end the relationship, ghost the victim, or engage in hurtful behavior. With this type of treatment, then the victim experiences profound emotional pain, rejection, and devastation. They may feel worthless, abandoned, and confused about what went wrong. In the discard phase, the narcissist will pull the rugs from under your feet, and when you fall, they will kick you while you are down. In Narcland, if you are not useful, then you are useless. Phase number four of the abuse cycle is hoovering, which comes from the popular Hoover Vacuum Company. So the pathological narcissist is going to try to drag their victims again back into this abuse cycle. 
it is important to understand as we go through this lesson that pathological narcissists do not get into mutually beneficial relationships with people. They get into various abuse cycles. In the hoovering phase, after a period of absence, the narcissist returns often with apologies, promises to change, and renewed affection. They will tell you that they've maybe seen the light and they will go to therapy or they've been to therapy. But it is important to understand that this is a part of the abuse cycle. It is a grand manipulation. At this stage of the game, sometimes the victim is feeling hope, right? They're craving the love and validation that they received during the idealization phase. And they may believe the narcissist has genuinely changed and give them another chance. This cycle can repeat itself multiple times with each cycle becoming more painful for the victim. Based on the data, they are saying that it takes on average seven times for someone to leave an abusive, toxic relationship. So if the average is seven, then some people make it out before they reach seven or even after. And there are people that will be caught up in these abusive cycles forever because they do not get the information that they need to leave. So here are four key points that you need to understand about the narcissistic abuse cycle. One, manipulation. The cycle is a manipulative tactic used by narcissists to maintain control over their victims. It keeps the victim emotionally invested and hopeful for a return to the idealization phase. Number two is you are on an emotional roller coaster. So the victim most likely is going to experience swinging between feeling valued and loved to feeling devalued and discarded. Number three is isolation. Narcissists often isolate their victims from their support networks, making it harder for them to seek help or perspective from others. And finally, we have cyclical reinforcement. So each cycle reinforces the victim's attachment to the narcissist, making it increasingly challenging to break free. It is important to understand that breaking free from this cycle requires recognizing the narcissistic behavior, seeking support, setting boundaries, and in many cases, cutting off contact with the narcissist. Additionally, coaching, therapy, and support groups can be a valuable resource for individuals trying to heal from narcissistic abuse and regain their sense of self-worth, self-control, and independence. Spotting a pathological narcissist again gets easier once you know that they have a pattern. So I'm going to share with you one extra pattern that you can look out for. And this is called Duper's Delight. And Duper's Delight is a term used in psychology to describe the emotional satisfaction or pleasure that some individuals experience when they successfully deceive or manipulate others. It is a nonverbal cue or expression that can reveal a person's enjoyment in fooling someone or getting away with deceitful behavior. Diane Downs shot her kids at close range, drove them to the hospital while they bled all over the car, claimed a scraggy-haired stranger did it. And you'll see when you see the video, she can't even pretend to be an agonizing mother. What you want to look for here is an incredible discrepancy between horrific events that she describes and her very, very cool demeanor. And if you look closely, you'll see duping delight throughout this video. But at night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That haunts me the most. Oftentimes you will see that when narcissists actually deceive people, they will have either a smirk or a type of grin on their face. This is indicative of the amusement and satisfaction that they get when they actually deceive other people. 
And there you have it, folks. I hope that in today's lesson, you have gathered useful and actionable information that you can use to spot pathological narcissists and also to protect yourself from these negative personality types. It is crucial to recognize the signs of narcissistic abuse, whether you are personally affected or supporting someone who is. Narcissistic abuse is a pervasive issue that affects many lives. Thank you for tuning in and we look forward to exploring this topic further with you. So ensure that you go ahead and like this channel, share the video, save the videos. And if you have any questions or feedback, go ahead and leave that in the comment section and I'll catch you in the next video.